that live in different places. Oops. Sorry about that. It wouldn't start earlier. So there we go. All of the indigenous people that make their homes and territories across the US. And we can see if we zoom on into the Pacific Northwest, where we're going to focus on today, and the North Cascades region of Washington, that there are many overlapping colors. And every color and name on the map is, is a distinct indigenous group of people with distinct languages, distinct cultures, and distinct practices. And in the Northwest here, we have quite a concentration of people and communities. I want to acknowledge that though the territory of these people is across all of the lands in Washington state, today there are very small reservation lands where people have been placed. And when we're speaking about the North Cascades, you'll see on this map, the orange represents where there are designated reservation lands. Um, you'll notice they're very small compared to the, all, the area that was colored in the previous slide. And also that where the North Cascades Park is and then the geologic region, there are no reservations within that region except for the tiny little reservation of the Sox Seattle. For, so for all this area that we're gonna be speaking about where we have access to go explore, learn about the natural history and recreate, there is a history of exclusion of the people who made their homes in this place. People are excluded from living up there presently, or in some cases, even like recreating and harvesting what they need. So I wanna set this context so that we're aware when we travel to these places that we can travel with a bit of gratitude, that we have quite a privilege to be able to access freely these spaces that are the homes of other people. And so we also acknowledge with gratitude all of the work that these people have done to steward the lands so that we, in this present generation of the people who get to access it, get to access a place that is relatively, especially in North Cascades National Park, ecologically intact. So thank you all from, for your time for that. And I encourage you to click on this link or explore on your own, but if you would like to contribute to the chat, any of the communities of people that call the land on which you're calling from home, you are welcome to share those territories. I'm calling from Portland, um, which gives us some of the, um, a little bit of the border of the Cowlitz Indian tribe, as well as there's many tribes down here in Portland, Competitor Tribes of the Warm Springs kind of overlaps there. And Evan, I can't see the chat while I'm presenting. So if you wanna just shout out anything that comes in the chat, please feel free. Sure. We have the Lummi tribe, the Nooksack tribe, the Duwamish, as well as the Coast Salish, the Swinomish and the Samish. Thanks everyone. And I encourage you, this is a great tool. I use this whenever I'm teaching online. Um, it's a very fun interactive map. And what you're seeing again are just the static screenshots. Okay, so I want to speak through this land acknowledgement. As we begin our gathering, we acknowledge that we each are attending remotely from the homelands of many different tribal nations. We pay respect to these people past and present and extend that respect to their descendants and to all indigenous people. As we discuss the geographic area of the North Cascades, we recognize that the very systems created to allow us access and recreation are created to intentionally exclude Indigenous people. To acknowledge the land is to recognize its longer history and our place in that history. It is to recognize these lands and waters and their significance for the people who lived and continue to live in this region, whose way of life and spiritual practice were and are tied to the land and the water, and whose lives continue to enrich and develop in relationship to the land, waters, and other inhabitants today. So some language that NCI has developed as a land acknowledgement. If you have questions or you're interested in this practice of acknowledging the lands before beginning a program, before beginning a field trip, at the end, I'm so happy to chat and discuss this. I find it's really um, important to bring this to the forefront when we're speaking about public land that we all get to access on this call. Okay, so here's an overview of what we're gonna do today. We're gonna do this quick, introductions and overview, which we're wrapping up right now. And then we're going to have three different rounds of questions. So round one is going to be three categories, two questions per category. We'll take about five minutes per question where I'm going to ask the question, we'll get someone to say an answer, and then I'll give a little talky-talky about each of the questions and why I'm excited about them. They're all very nerdy questions. 
almost all of the questions come from my natural history journal, which I was taking in the North Cascades. And so it was really fun to go back in time to my personal journal. Round number two, same format, three categories, two questions per category. And then we'll have a final challenge question. We'll do some thank yous, some prizes, and say good night. So real quick, Evan's going to give a shout out about some of the prizes that we have available here. Yes, I am. First, um, just for being here tonight, you will get one of these lovely North Cascades Institute stickers created by, I believe the artist is Gretchen Leggett. She's a legend. She's a Bellingham-based artist, does murals and stickers. So um, you'll get one of those. And then uh, I have a magical spreadsheet that I have on a different in open on a different window on my computer and I'm keeping track of who answers the questions so um, that'll help me reveal at the end the person who has answered or the duo who has answered the most questions and for the third place winner we will give you a hat pictured is the mountain goat hat but you'll have an option of other hats um, a North Cascades Institute t-shirt and for the grand prize, you will get a $50 off a future field class with us at North Cascades Institute. Those are the prizes, not to mention the unending honor of being the grand champion at So You Think You Know the North Cascades. Back to you, Gina. Sounds great. Okay, everyone, let us start this competition. Here we go, round one. We've got three categories here. The first category is rocks for jocks. My virtual background is a thin section, a slice of a rock under a microscope. And my original training and entry point into natural history was through geology. So that's why this is the first category. Second category, fungus among us. Evan and I have bonded and our uh, friend relationship has grown through our love of fungus. So I wanted to put this category number two, second is the best. Third category, I'm green. If I was blue, I would die. Anybody get the reference there? I looked up that band. <laughs> so they're like a they're like a massively popular boy band in Italy. And I had not known that until today when I looked them up again. Eiffel 65, check them out. Um, it's totally fine if you don't know what I'm talking about. Let's begin. So just to remind, when the next question comes up, go ahead and buzz in. Why don't you just I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Why don't you go ahead and practice buzzing in right now? Everybody just go ahead and type something in as fast. Oh my gosh, holy smokes. Whoa, I had hardly finished saying it. You are ready. I can sense that this group is ready. So let us begin. Go ahead and use the chat feature as soon as Gina asks her first question. Okay, the first category, I'm green. If I was blue, I would die. First question, what is the name of the compound the Pacific in the Pacific U for which this plant is commercially harvested and what is the commercial significance? Bonus, identify the name of a group that works with this compound which shares an acronym with NCI. So Kathleen, was that letter P that you typed in, was that in response to this question? We've got a steep competition tonight, everyone. <laughs> Kathleen, was, uh, was your letter I'll, P for this I'll, I'll go ahead. It's, um, it's Taxol. Yeah, wow. And it's used uh, it's, as an early chemotherapeutic agent, which is still used today. I am very impressed. Gina, is that the correct answer? Uh, that is the correct answer. I'm wondering, though, before I switch the slide, if anyone would like to answer the bonus question. Or... Yeah, I have to play the sound effect. <laughs> All right, Kathleen, I'm marking you up on the big board here. And let's see, anyone at any going once, going twice to answer the bonus question. Wait, Gina, sorry, I'm sorry. Remember, you, you can't see the chat, so I need to tell you that we have a buzz in from Kim Nelson. I'm, I'm gonna guess and say National Cancer Institute. I don't know. Okay, Evan, you got the sound effect. <laughs> okay, everyone, well done. 
Um, that was great. I'm impressed. I'm not great at remembering names, but I want to give you some um, little tips to help us remember the names that we have here. So yes, this is a photograph of the Pacific yew, one of my favorite plants to find, and it's actually incredibly common in the old growth forest of the North Cascades, um, especially in drainages, and I love coming across it. It was commercially harvested for some time because of this compound in its bark that's used in the treatment of certain types of cancer. Um, that word taxol comes from the root of the word taxon, the Greek word taxon, which means bow, because this is a plant that's prized for its really strong wood and historically has been used to make bows. Um, ironically, even though we're using this plant for medicine, almost every part of the Pacific U is deadly poisonous and eating even very small amounts of the bark, needles or seeds can kill a person. And I like to do when I do berry identification, it's really important to point out this red berry. In contrast, it's about the same size and shape as a red huckleberry. So it's really good to learn your plant ID before you start foraging and eating wild berries. Yes, correct on the National Cancer Institute. Nicely done. I want to give us just a quick little timeline of the process for kind of discovering this as a commercially viable drug. So it was back in the early 60s that samples of the used bark was first collected. I don't know what sparked that, um, but this was the USDA was under contract with the National Cancer Institute to find a natural products that might help cure cancer. And so then by the late 70s, Taxol was selected for clinical development. The problem was it's really difficult to find these trees. I don't know if you all have experience in the forests of the North Cascades, but these are understory trees and they look very similar to other fir trees and they often grow in like dense forests and often in old growth. And it's hard to find healthy stands of old growth. Really the North Cascades is one of the largest stands of old growth that I know of that I go to in our region. And so to find enough to harvest is an issue. And there was a bit of a time where there was an over harvesting of the use in our area. I think the National Park was excluded from that. So I think that's why there's such an abundance at both Mount Rainier National Park and North Cascades National Park. Um, these clinical trials became possible when there was a method created to actually derive and extract taxol from the common yew, which is a common plant in many people's backyards. So if I go back to that photograph, you might recognize a plant that's got those little red like seed like berries on it from your own backyard or your neighbor's backyard. These are actually common um, plants throughout the country. So once they could get the compound, not from the wild native growing Pacific yew, but from the common yew, that facilitated more. And finally, in the 90s, uh, Taxol was approved for early treatment, as someone was saying, for ovarian and breast cancer, but also there was the process where their laboratory cell culture method, so I don't know if you still have to have a starting compound from the real plants, but either way, it can be synthetically generated modeling and mimicking the chemistry of the natural plants. Um, and so because of that, that means that it could be broadly manufactured and distributed. So to date, and this was an interesting statistic I didn't know, what's the point of trivia, learning something new, Taxol is the best selling cancer drug ever manufactured. Um, this was an article from a couple of years ago, but it wasn't, didn't seem super out of date to me. So I find that pretty exciting. Um, I want to open up for any questions if anyone wants to chat about this drug. Maybe you're familiar with this because it's in a certain type of treatment. Pasclitaxel is the name of the compound, and then Taxol is like the pharmaceutical name for that drug. Whoa. Okay, so I'm not hearing any questions or seeing any questions, but maybe we'll take another moment. If anyone has anything to share about this plant. Can we get a quick poll? Like how many people knew the answer? Maybe how many people thought they knew the answer? Kathleen chatted in that synthesizing taxol probably saved the Pacific U from extinction, Gina. Yeah, I have heard that. Um, 
And I think that I, I see these trees in abundance just because I happen to spend the most amount of time in Mount Rainier National Park or North Cascades National Park where they are, like mm -hmm. can be really abundant along river drainages. Um, but yeah, I think that you're right. I think it was really important that the switch was made to this more synthetic based manufacturing. Um, wow, I encourage you all to get out and explore the use in your neighborhood and in the forest. Just don't eat those berries. And encourage people to know what berries are toxic. How about on to the next question? On to the next question. The ash ball from what volcanic eruption produced soils in the alpine meadows of the North Cascades? And bonus question, how long ago was this eruption? I, we have a buzz in here from Amelia. Go ahead, Amelia. Was it Mazama? Was that the one? Yes. Nicely done. Amelia, do you know the name for Mount Mazama, what people call it today? Oh man, I don't know. I feel like I know, but I'm not 100% sure. And would anyone like to answer the bonus question? How long ago was this eruption? Oh, oh goodness. From Amelia. Can I take a wild guess and say 10,000 years? You can definitely okay, guess. Definitely you can guess, but Gina? That's actually pretty close to accurate, Amelia. The answer is yes, Mount Mazama, which had created uh, Crater Lake. And the answer is close to 10,000 years ago, about 7,700 years ago. So I want to just speak about this because it was something I learned when I was hiking in the Alpine, when I was asked to consider how fragile the soil ecosystem is up high. And so first let's talk about the volcano because I actually work at Mount St. Helens and I love volcanoes. Um, so Mount Mazama was a relatively large volcano, 12,000 feet high. That's about the height of Mount Adams. And when it had this explosive eruption, this is an artist's rendering, it was such a large explosion that it just pulverized the whole mountain. And I was teaching about volcanoes to kids today and they're always like, what does the lava look like? Doesn't the lava flow? But in these cases with these explosive eruptions from these volcanoes, the lava is coming out in the form of um, small fragments and shards of volcanic rock in the form of ash and other volcanic debris. So from this eruption, some takeaways, if you want some numbers, 12 cubic miles of magma erupted. And what did that magma look like? It was in the form of tiny pieces of volcanic debris and volcanic ash, and mainly pumice and fine ash. So that makes that this eruption was the largest known eruption of the active Cascades volcanoes in the last 10,000 years. And because it was such a large eruption, it created so much material. And so all of that material was deposited across the landscape of the mountains in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I threw in more numbers here. Pumice and ash covered a surface area of more than 100,000, a million square miles with at least a millimeter of debris. That's an incredible amount of ash. Um, 10 to 13 square miles of rock that had actually made up the volcano kind of were collapsed, pulverized. And this is an eruption that was witnessed by indigenous people. And I don't work at Crater Lake, so I don't know as many of the stories, but similar to Mount St. Helens, this is a volcano that people were around for when this big eruption happened. And it dramatically changed things in the region for quite some time. A few particles of Mazama ash are found as far away as Greenland, which is exciting. But a lot of the ash was distributed around the Pacific Northwest. And I put in this cool image, I was just getting um, a map. So first I put a red star for where we are, that's us. And then this is what's called an isopack, which is a science name for um, in geology where you're trying to map strata like rock layers or ash layers with the same thickness. And so this map kind of shows you the distribution of the thickness. So you can see 
um, that the thickness of ash in the North Cascades region where the star was, was between 10 and five centimeters, which is, you know, considerable amount of ash. Um, and what's exciting in this diagram in particular is that some scientists actually recreated what the habitat was at the time of this eruption 7,000 years ago. And the habitat wasn't significantly different, but you can see today we don't have tundra in the North Cascades. That eco type has moved up as the climate has warmed over time. This was still close to the ice age. Anyways, I got really nerdy, but we'll move on. Um, <laughs> and then yes, the process of reconstructing past habitats is a science of paleoecology. And if you wanna talk about this, come meet me after class or we can hang out virtually or whatever. But paleoecology is really a burgeoning science. It's a, a branch of geology that's only been around since we've had like a little bit more better lab chemical analyses to be able to make these very detailed um, reconstructions of what habitat was like in the past. Why do we care about volcanic ash in the North Cascades? It's because this ash, because it was so widespread, first of all, it serves as a really important dating and marker in the rock record for the archaeological record. When we have this layer of ash, we know it's from Mount Mazama and it's from that date, 700, 7,700 years ago, plus or minus. I don't know the exact, exact date. Um, and that's really important if you have like evidence, archaeological evidence that's underneath that, it's older, or stuff that's on the other side that's younger. And this map shows some of the other volcanoes that have had really large tephra fall or ash fall distributed over a large area, which overlaps where the North Cascades are a little bit. Um, so you can see Mount St. Helens, my home volcano, Glacier Peak, and Mount Mazama is the big orange. And then the, um, the Bridge River coming from Mount Meager, which was further north. The ash is also important, and this goes back to your original question, because it provides nutrients. Essentially, the volcano is a soup of elements, and all of these elements are coming down, raining down on the landscape. And you're taking these rough, glacially scoured rock faces of the North Cascades, and you're dumping material that's crushed up, so small that there's a lot of surface area on the particles. You can look at the image behind me and imagine this is like a piece of pumice, what it looks like through the microscope. And so all these little fragments, that's lots of surface area for bacteria to grow. And as bacteria and weathering affects every little surface area of these crushed up pulverized pieces of volcanic rock, that creates the nutrients that can create soil. So you first get some of the minerals breaking down into clay minerals, and then those can become in biologically available forms, and then plants can use them. I could talk about this all day, I'm gonna stop. But the final thing I want for the takeaway is that for you to know that soil formation in the North Cascades, so we had glaciers scour everything, and all of the plants that we see out in the North Cascades have all grown in soils that have developed from the end of the last ice age, about 11,000, 10,000 years ago. And so how do you get soils to form? Well, you either have ash blowing in from big eruptions, you have glaciers depositing their own pulverized pieces of rock, or you have the breakdown of the rock itself, the bedrock. But we've got really hard rock in the North Cascades, so it doesn't happen very frequently. I want to pause for a moment and see if anyone has questions about this. I think it's tremendously important for us as we recreate in the Alpine to think about how long it takes the soils to form and how infrequent an eruption the size of Mount Mazama's eruption is. And so when I'm like setting up my campsite in the backcountry in the high Alpine lake region, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm putting my tent on a place where the soil has taken 10,000 years to form and a lot of the nutrients came from a volcanic eruption 7,000 years ago. I might suggest that in the interest of time, we move on to the next question. Oh my gosh, Evan, you want me to stop talking about chemistry and rocks? Okay, everyone, next category is rocks for jocks. This question, what animal is the namesake of this mineral? And bonus, if you can name another animal that's the namesake of a type of this mineral. This is a very rock-headed question. Oh, Amelia, was that a buzz in? Maybe. Um, there's an apostrophe there. Is that your apostrophe? Yeah, it is. I don't, the only one I can think of is a Labradorite, but I don't know if that's Ooh, anything. That's, that's very cute because Labradors are cute. 
Gina, can you uh, tell us whether or not that's correct? That is incorrect. Did anyone else buzz in? Sorry, that was kind of a harsh sound effect, Amelia. Is there anyone else that wants to try for the answer here? You have nothing to lose by guessing. I wonder if there's a cricket sound effect. I just downloaded all these sound effects. Maybe, <laughs> maybe there's a crickets. I can give a hint. It's uh, if you look at that green colored surface in the photograph, think about an animal that that looks like. This is only a test. Ooh, that's bad. That's terrible. Terrible sound effect. Okay, Evan, well, if no one's buzzing in, I'm happy to reveal the answer here. Go ahead and reveal the answer, Gina. Okay, everyone, the answer is serpentine, and it's like a serpent. And there's a serpentine mineral called lizardite, because again, it's that green color, and that would be the lizard. So those are the two animals there. And I bring this up because it's actually one of my favorite rocks and minerals. Um, but essentially in the North Cascades, we have many, many different rock types squished together. And the processes that can squish together many types of rocks often have to do with the movement of tectonic plates. And there have been many times where we've had terrains or pieces of other rock that have come in on plates and that has come together and kind of like crunched up the many types of rocks that we have in a concentrated area in the North Cascades. And the North Cascades has such a diversity of rock types that it is a joy to be a geologist and live in that place. And so serpentine is one of the more colorful minerals there. And I included this diagram, which is a little complicated. It's from California, but the same processes happen up here where you basically have the plate, that green at the bottom moving material in, and that kind of lines and stacks everything up. And when you get things stacked very tightly, all of a sudden you can have many different rock types, like many books on the shelf, kind of like all tilting and stacking together. Uh, holding space for questions, if anyone has questions about this mineral or this question. Maybe people have this in their backyard. I used to have a necklace that was a serpentine necklace. Um, Sometimes serpentine can be called soapstone. Talc can also be called soapstone. It's very soft and it's great for carving. Gina. Yeah. We have one comment from Kathleen saying, love that rock, followed by a question from Catherine says, is it flaky? It's very flaky. In fact, it is, um, the, if you look at the structure under the microscope, there are little sheets of all the atoms that make up that mineral. And so when you rub your fingers on it, just like soapstone or talc, you're actually rubbing off sheets of atoms. Um, so it will rub off on your finger and create like a soapy kind of feel. And I have some here, but we're virtual. So I encourage you to get out in the field and take some field-based geology classes. But the Sisters Mountains outside of Bellingham, which are a little bit on the outside of the North Cascades National Park, but considered in the North Cascades geologic region, are composed of this rock. So it's that orange color, high iron rich rock. And then when it weathers, when it interacts with water, it creates that beautiful green serpentine. So there's other places in the park to see it as well, but I encourage you to get out and hike some places where this is abundant because it's just absolutely beautiful. Okay, everyone. Question number two in the Rocks for Jocks category. In the 50 years between 1959 and 2009, what percentage of glacial coverage in the North Cascades has been lost? A depressing question, but here we go. Oh, we have a buzz in from none other than Amelia. Taking a guess and saying 60. Gina? It's not quite 60 yet. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, that's a high number, but you're in the correct order of magnitude range. Well then, how about this? Why don't we give the opportunity to the next person who buzzed in, uh, Kathleen? I'm gonna, uh, I thought it was almost 50. Gina? 
Okay, it's not quite that high either. And this is just between 1959 and 2009. Then, That's um, not 50. The next buzz in was from Rebecca. Rebecca, would you like to guess? Or I'm gonna go, I'll go 40%. <laughs> Very good, wise. <laughs> Some strategies emerging. Gina? Okay, everyone, <laughs> I'm gonna reveal the answer, which is the number that I have from John Riedel, the park glaciologist who has given programs to North Cascades in the past is 19%, but about 20. So we were almost there. Someone might've guessed it. Um, 60 is a little bit much, but 19% loss of glacial area is quite a substantial loss. And I wanted to just go over some basics. Why do we talk about glaciers when we talk about the North Cascades? Well, outside of Alaska, within the United States, the North Cascades contains the most glaciated area. And it's tremendous and exciting, and it's different than Glacier National Park. Many people think, oh, I'm going to go to Glacier National Park and see all the glaciers. The North Cascades has an order of magnitude more glaciers than Glacier National Park. They have on the order of 30 to 70, and we have about 700. Now, out of all these glaciers, we have scientists that have been measuring and monitoring them and studying them. And some of the monitoring happens with like high school education programs. A lot of it happens with like early career professional geoscientists. The US Geological Survey facilitates a lot of the research. Overall, the science has shown that all of the glaciers in the North Cascades have been retreating. And in fact, all the glaciers in the lower 48 have been retreating since about the 80s, except for the glacier where I work at Mount St. Helens, it's the only growing glacier in the lower 48. And that's just because the volcano erupted and now there's a new space for the glacier to grow. If you wanna talk about that glacier, the Donut Glacier. Talk to me after. Um, and so some of these glaciers are completely disappearing, which, you know, glaciers are constantly growing and shifting in their size. But for all of them to be changing in their size, that shows like a climactic shift in our region. So it's really important for us to understand, first of all, to recognize like how much the glaciers are changing. And then for us to think about why do we even care about glaciers and snow and ice in the first place in the mountains. And that's because I love this photograph, all the snow and ice translates down into our water system. And if we have snow that's contained in glacial ice, snow falls, and then it's kind of locked up in glacial ice, that is a reservoir of water that can send water down the rivers throughout the whole season. And so when you're losing that reservoir, then all of a sudden you're losing all of that. Um, potential to have water in the summer season when it's not raining very much in our area. So here's some photographs showing some of the recession. These are extreme. These are extreme. But I just want to put this out there and we can have more of a discussion about it if people would like. This is from the Banded Glacier. So photograph around 1970, 1960. And then John Skurlock is the pho photographer who takes these amazing aerial photographs of the North Cascades. I highly recommend his coffee table book. He's fantastic. He has a wonderful website. And this is his photograph in 2016. So you can see the change in the area of that ice mass. Yeah. And then another photograph showing this glacier on Mount Baker, the Easton Glacier, which is pretty easy to hike up to. Um, so these arrows kind of show some of those key marker points and you can see the recession like with the red arrow and the purple arrow. I want to hold space if anyone has questions or comments about the change in the glacial glaciation in the North Cascades region. Okay, um, then I'm gonna move on to our final category of this round, which is the fungus among us. The question here is, what mushroom are these? <laughs> can you name this mushroom? And bonus, can you share what the best way is to cook this mushroom? Okay, we got a buzz in right away from Kathleen. Uh, Matsutake. Almost the cover photo of this book, <laughs> not quite. Mm. Um, Amazing, the matsutake. Do you know, can you speak about how to cook this variety of mushroom? I wish I could. Mm. Would anyone else like to buzz in for that bonus question? I'd like to buzz in for that bonus question. Um, 
you just cook it very gently. You don't want to fry a matsutake because you will ruin its flavor. You want to bake it or roast it. You can even boil it atop some rice. Fabulous. So yes, the matsutake, the matsutake is famous for its aroma. I can smell it when I'm hiking and then I get really excited. Um, and so cooking it to capitalize on that aroma versus like sauteing and all the aromatic qualities kind of leave. That's the key of cooking this mushroom. If you want to cook it in traditional ways, it can be steamed with rice. And you can see some of these recipes here from this fun website that I love, Modern Forager. Um, these are famously called pine mushrooms. They tend to associate with pine trees, um, but pine trees include, you know, our Douglas fir, our true firs, hemlocks, tan oaks. So pine is a really broad category. So it's not super helpful for mushroom identification. But in general, they're, they're often restricted to certain elevations, but they grow in a diversity of habitats and they're highly, highly prized. People come emigrate to this part of the country just to pick these mushrooms. It's a slightly different variety than they have in Japan, but they still go for a really steep price. And most people aren't familiar with this, but it is legal to harvest edible mushrooms in the national parks. Every national park has a different designation. I think it's like one five gallon bucket per person per day in the North Cascades, maybe, or maybe less than that. And then a different designation in Mount Rainier National Park. So when I go mushroom hunting, I look for the oldest forest because it's gonna have the most diversity of mushrooms and the most time for that mycorrhizal relationship between the fungus and the trees to develop. Those are just the things that I love. Um, so if anyone would like to share any questions that they have about this mushroom or any thoughts. The only prohibited question is where is your matsutake spot? We will not I shall that. not tell. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that you will have better luck finding these. I mean, people do find them in younger forests but I'm an old growth snob just from my time living up in the North Cascades. That yeah, we do have a question from Kathleen or John. Yeah. The question is, do you find chanterelles in old growth forests? Yes, you often find the white chanterelles that are a little bit more common in the older forests. Yeah. And they smell, I'm just gonna say, they kind of smell like starburst candy. Next time you find a white chanterelle, pick it, give it a sniff and tell me if it doesn't smell like starburst. And I will say that these mushrooms look very much similar to a very deadly toxic all white mushroom. So it's really important when you're picking uh, white mushrooms to know the toxic ones and um, don't be silly. Don't be silly about it. So go out with find a friend that knows their mushrooms or join a local mushroom club. Okay, our last question in this round, what important ecological role does this lichen play in the forests of the North Cascades? Bonus if you can name the scientific name. Genus okay, and we have a buzz in already from Kathleen. Oh my goodness, go ahead. I'm going to say it's fixing nitrogen and returning it to the forest floor. And I think it's Loberia. Uh, Loberia, I can't quite see. I think it's Loberia organa. Okay. Or else it's Loberia pulmonaria. Pulmonary is what I was getting at. I okay. didn't take this photograph myself. It's a very luscious pulmonary. Well done. Nicely done, <laughs> to Kathleen. Um, so yes, exactly as you're saying, why do we care about these lichen? Will they grow higher up in the canopy? And then when they fall to the forest floor, that's taking all of these nutrients that the lichen has made biologically available. And then it's down in the leaf litter and the forest debris for other plants and decomposers to break it down and for that to cycle back into the forest. This is a healthy looking Loberia. It's called um, lungwort colloquially because it looks a little bit like a lung. And here's a diagram with text that you can't read, but really what I just wanted to show you was this cycling pattern. So we go from forest where the, um, what's in the lichen is like taking nutrients from the air in some cases, cycling that back down, cycling it around. I just want you to pay attention to the cycling. I ended up going on a deep dive about um, lichen and a lichen is a relationship between a fungus, which kind of forms a structure, and then um, either cyanobacteria or green algae inside that do the photosynthesizing. That's why in this photograph, we've got the green color, but the fungus is what makes the shape of what the green is growing in. And there's been a lot of talk about lichen, like, oh, 
the fungus and the bacteria are co-living together and they're supporting each other. But there's also some research, and I was diving into this rabbit hole, saying that the lichen can be in some level like farming the bacteria. They're choosing different species of bacteria or algae to um, kind of like collect inside themselves based on the conditions like the microhabitat and what nutrients are available. So there's a lot of um, decision making that's being done by the fungus, which is really cool. So that's a little bit of this paper, which was published pretty recently, talking about, I made the text really small, so you could just take my word for it. But essentially, the recent results about bacterial associations with lichen symbiosis corroborate their notion as a multi-species symbiosis, blah, 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 big text. The takeaway, lichen are really important recyclers of nutrients in the forest, and um, kind of some of the classic examples of reduced reuse recycle, nothing left to waste. So, Happy to answer questions about lichen, but for the sake of time, I wanted to not dive in too, too deep here. But there's a lot of really interesting research happening about lichen right now because it's been very understudied. Fungus in general has been an understudied science. And so we know a lot about the trees, but we don't know as much about how the trees and the fungus interact or how the trees and the lichen interact. Would anyone like to share any observations, notes, questions? So they, these people, we propose that the lichen thallus, which is the structure, has evolved to function as a smart harvester of bacterial symbionts. It's kind of fun techie language to say that they think the fungus is like playing a big role. Okay, everyone, we are going to end round one. I'll let Evan take it from here. All right. If you haven't been keeping track yourself, uh, I will let you know that currently in the lead is the dynamic duo, Kathleen and John. And in a close second is Amelia. And Kim, actually Kim and Amelia are tied with one point each. That's great, nice work everyone. So those are the winners so far, but we'll keep going for round two. We've got a short break. I'm going to throw it out there. Anybody need five minutes before we come back for round two? No. Okay. Okay. We've got three categories again. Those categories are where the wild things are, take me to the river, and where's Waldo? All right. Just a reminder, folks, we're buzzing in. Seems to be working well so far. Just tap, type anything into the chat and here we go. Okay, first category, where the wild things are. First question, what bird makes the sound? I'm gonna play the video here. And if you can identify the ecological role or a unique role that this bird plays in the forests of the Cascades. Are we all ready? Here we go. And no, the car backing up and is not part of the bird song, but that's still the song clip that Cornell Lab of Ornithology taught, chose to put on their website, which I always like their recordings, but I was just surprised that the backing up sound was so prominent. Okay, everyone, but anyone, any buzz, anyone has buzzed in, Evan? We have some buzzes, buzzes in. Um, I just want to ask one clarifying question. Kim and Amelia, were you waiting till the video ended to buzz in? No, Amelia wasn't. I, I, I think it's, I think Kathleen and the team, that team should definitely go. Okay, go ahead, Kathleen. Um, Clark's Nutcracker. Ooh, hang well on. done. Do you know the ecological role that this bird plays in the forests? Um, yeah, they, uh, they open up uh, pine cones, um, White bark pine, I guess, and others that couldn't, uh, the seeds couldn't get out without them. 
Well done, John. That's exactly it. So this bird is the Clark's Nutcracker. And when I'm hiking in especially higher elevation, I listen for that sound. It's kind of that frog-like croak. It's very grating, but it makes me really excited because I'm excited to see these birds. These birds are listed on the endangered species list in Canada. They're not in the United States although they could be. Some people say it's a little bit of a political decision because these birds are tied very strongly to this one type of tree that grows in higher elevations and they're very sensitive to the changes that are happening with climate change as our forests and our ecosystems are changing. Um, this, this bird in particular, you can see it's still there. It's got this very strong beak. Um, it is strong enough to break apart the seed cones of the white bark pine, which I don't think that's a white bark pine in this photograph. I think that's a lodgepole. But um, regardless, the white bark pine has needles that are clustered in groups of five. And that plant has really evolved in relationship to this bird. The pine cones, the seeds cannot disperse without this specific bird breaking it apart. And, that means that you know, with you have two species tied in that way, that they're a little bit more sensitive and less resilient to changes such as climate change. So again, same photo, you can see their big beak. They rip out the pine cones and pull out the large seeds, and they can stash all these seeds in their mouth, and then they'll carry them to uh, a cache. And there's been studies. I don't have the numbers, but I think that the rate of these birds remembering where all their cached seeds are is something like in the 90s, like maybe 90%. But every, every once in a while, the birds will plant all these seeds in the cache and then forget about them. And that is one way that these trees are able to grow because the birds are caching them in places where they can grow. So other pines, white bark pine, also the limber pine, Colorado pinion pines, single leaf pinion pines, southwestern white pines, those are all out of our region. Really, it's just the white bark pine in the North Cascades depend on these nutcrackers to do this. And a couple of fun facts about the Clarks. Um, it's got this special pouch, as I mentioned, kind of like a chipmunk to carry all the seeds. And then also it's one of the few members of the crow family where the male incubates the eggs, which I think is really darling. Would anyone like to share anything about Clark's Nutcrackers or um, anything that, yeah, you know about these, this relationship or the forests? You, I've seen them in uh, Ponderosa pine forests too, up in Mazama. So I don't know if the Ponderosa's can do without them or, but they seem to be eating the pine, the ponderosa pine nuts too. Yeah, I don't know if the Clark's diet needs to be restricted to the white bark pine and other pinion pines, but I'm pretty sure the white bark pine has a little bit more nutrition in its pine, in its like seeds than the, um, than other species. Like for example, the pinion pine in the Southwest is just like more nutrient dense and so, that makes that like an even better pine cone for the bird to break into. So I wonder if that has to play a little bit into it. Um, but yeah, I think that they, you know, they're not restricted to the higher elevation where you have some of those pines, but I often see them in that habitat a little bit more. Great point though. And I love their prehistoric sounding calls. Mm. Don't you love, I chose the most melodious bird song for our presentation tonight. <laughs> have a sound effect for that. Well, everyone, I'm going to move to our next question. What specific, again, this is in where the wild things are category. What specific habitat in the North Cascades is essential to the survival and reproduction of wolverines? And bonus, what part of the wolverine range is actually represented in the North Cascades? Are we in the range of wolverines? Are we like on the southern end, the eastern end? We have a buzz in from Kim. Hey, I only know this because I, I just took, or I just watched that video from Conservation Northwest um, where they had the wolverine biologist. But I want to say that, you know, the habitat that's essential would probably be the glaciers, I guess. Um, and that we are on uh, more of, you see the southernmost, 
I think that's kind of it, even though there is some that go further south where I would say we're, or, yeah, southernmost. That looks right to me. Let me guess that. Wow, thanks, Kim. That's pretty close to being spot on. So yes, you can see this is a range map of the Wolverine. And then in the Cascades, that little western, I put it, should have put a circle on here. You can see we're extending into the southernmost range within the Cascade Mountains. There's some, there's the dark pink range and then the light pink range. And the dark pink is like where they're living and the light pink is where the males will roam. They will roam out in these huge territories, much like cougars or lynx. They just have like really large, large territories. Um, but we want to pay attention to that dark pink color. And this was, yeah, a pretty recent, you know, this map was made in 2019. So that shows their present range nicely done. Um, and some important information about the wolverine, these are wide ranging animals, as I mentioned. They inhabit remote areas that are near tree line and they're very sensitive to human disturbances. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, this is a photograph of some wolverine studies. There's a lot of emphasis on this animal right now because it's related to the glaciers. It's somewhat of a marker of how our like winters and climate are changing over time. This animal needs the snow and ice in the springtime for its natal dens. It has, they have their little babies kits in the spring and so they need to have snowpack that goes through the spring maybe even into the early summer and so when we get lower snowpack in our mountains they're not restricted to glaciers because they can't dig their dens into glacial ice but they are restricted to places where you have thick snowpack enough for that where they can like dig their dens and if you there's a fantastic book about wolverines the wolverine way that i highly recommend but also um it's very rare to see these animals they're very reclusive um, here's a, a diagram showing where some of the current camera trapping is, which is like within the North Cascades National Park region, extending out to the east side, like Mazama Twist. And the note here that I have had on all the slides is just that, you know, I'm getting into some backcountry skiing. Here's a photograph of someone doing some backcountry skiing. These are very um, elusive animals that can be um, very much impacted by just the simple fact of like more people recreating in the winter time. So it's something to think about in our um, region, in our park, where we have a lot of high mountain areas and a lot of people come from all over the world for some of that backcountry recreation. I'm a strong proponent of restricting um, travel with snowmobiles that's even more disruptive than just travel with people on skis. But for example, people snowmobiling at Washington Pass and getting out to some of those backcountry locations for big skiing is a really, um, really popular sport right now in the spring. Does anyone want to comment on wolverines? Has anyone seen a wolverine in real life? I have seen tracks. Um, but yeah, they're pretty elusive. And if you're interested in volunteering, there are some great, like a lot of the camera trapping work is done by volunteers. So it's a great animal that's very, you know, it's so cute, look at them. <laughs> I mean, they're incredible, very smart weasel family animals. And there's a lot of citizen science that's involved in some of the monitoring. So it's a good animal to know about. Well done, thanks, Kim. So yeah, I would say I'll give you the points. They're not restricted to glaciers, but they need, late season snowpack. Just give me one point, don't give me two points. Add up to Evan. Okay, everyone, our next category, take me to the river. In what year was the Skagit River designated as a wild and scenic river system? Bonus, if you can answer, how does this designation affect land management along the river? And we already have a buzz in from Amelia. This is kind of a guess. I think like 1975. Clo yeah. Very close, not quite on the money. Well, let's uh, let's give Rebecca a chance here. Maybe she's got the right answer. Or sorry, maybe Rebecca has the right answer. I don't know if I do. I think it was more, I was thinking more recent, but maybe not. Um, I'll go 2005. 2005, Gina? Thank does anyone want to answer how does the designation of wild and scenic affect land management or practices? Well, we do have one more buzz in from Kathleen. Perhaps 
they have an answer to the main question? I thought it was around 1984. Gina, okay, any, correct, any correct answers there? Incorrect, you can play the incorrect buzzer. <laughs> oh, let's the, uh, here, here we go, here we go. Where is the, it's coming up, hold still, here we go. Okay, everyone, so the Skagit was designated as wild and scenic in 1978. And one concrete way that that designation, designation changes land management use is it restricts new hydroelectric projects, but it grandfathers in any type of use that's been on the river so far. So it is important to get this designation. It means like, <laughs> I actually have the stamp book, the wild and scenic river stamp, I can't really see this, but it was like, a stamp book. It brings publicity and awareness to the fact that these are important river systems to have that designation. And then in practice, it restricts some activities moving forward. But I want to talk about the Skagit River because it is the lifeblood um, flowing through and draining all of the North Cascades. Um, it's classified as scenic in the small portion for about 100 miles, recreational for about 60 miles. And um, all of the tributaries of this river, the major tributaries that drain the North Cascades Mountains, so that'd be the Sauk, Suyatl, and Cascade Rivers are all classified as scenic rivers as well. So there's the map. Um, I had the opportunity to paddle down almost the entire length of the Skagit all the way to the saltwater, starting in Marble Mount, Washington, which is right at the boundary of North Cascades National Park. And that was quite the learning experience um, to get a sense for our river system and how it flows. Um, this is a really important river in our country, especially in the lower 48. It's the largest and most biologically um, important river that flows into Puget Sound. And it contains like all five species of native salmon. Um, it also has the largest concentration of bald eagles and bull trout in the lower 48. So very exciting outside of Alaska. I mean, this is imagining that British Columbia doesn't exist because we're just talking about United States, but in the United States outside of Alaska, it drains the area with the most essential glacial, glacial coverage, which we did talk about. Um, what does this mean to have this wild and scenic designation? Well, here's the language. River systems designated for preservation of their free flowing condition, water quality, and outstanding remarkable scenic recreational geological uses. What does this mean in practice? Keeping these rivers free flowing, so that's restricting hydro projects like dams. Um, protecting natural and cultural values, that's very vague language. <laughs> Allowing existing use of rivers to continue where they don't conflict with the river protection. And a lot about building partnerships around this designation. So here's a little map that shows a little bit of who owns the land around this river system. So that purple in the center is National Park. We've got wilderness area, which is the green. National forest is the yellow. State and private lands are the purple. So our river, most of the watershed is draining public land. And that's really exciting. And you can see some of those numbers here. Does anyone have any questions or comments on the Skagit River wild and scenic system? It's probably the most like, oh, it just has, it's just so uh, successful in having all of these types of salmon and like draining such an immense area with such like strong, I mean, draining such a heavily glaciated area just means it has consistent water flow throughout the season. So makes for really good whitewater kayaking, but also really important to get water coming down into the summertime for all the irrigation that happens in the lower Skagit, Cedar Woolley. So really, really an important river. Um, oh, a lot more text. Quote, it prohibits federal support for actions such as the construction of dams or other in-stream activities that would harm the river's free flowing condition, water quality, or outstanding resource values. Okay, everyone, we're gonna move on to our next take me to the river question, which is name the four federally recognized tribal nations who make their home and or were displaced from the Skagit River watershed. 
Um, there are, in fact, five. So you can name four or five. Or that's kind of the, OK, so this would be the four in the US, and then there's one in Canada. So you can just list all five, or you can give the answer to the bonus question, the name of that tribe, that First Nation in Canada. OK, we have a buzz in from Kathleen. All right, let's see. I think I can remember this. We've got um, Upper Skagit, Sauk Seattle, um, Swinomish, and um, oh, that's three. No. Um, upper Skagit, Sauk Seattle. Cinemish. Uh, I'm I'm gonna staff it. Ah, I can't remember the fourth. Gina, how do you feel about that answer? If anyone else wants to answer, there's still two more tribal nations to be named. Amelia does have a guess in the chat, which is Salish. Great. Anyone Let's else? Say I'll say one. It's that nobody else has any other, like Inkla Kopma. Mm. Thanks, Kim. Well done, everyone. And so here, we go on, Gina, we do have three more guesses in the chat. Came straight in the chat. Oh. Samish, Lummi, and Nooksack. Okay, great. So I was focusing on the tribal nations that are along the river. Lummi is at the mouth. Um, I didn't include them, but I think, yeah, I think it's a little reductionist in this question to just focus on these, but these are the ones that I have. Um, the Swinomish, Samish, Inglakotma, Upper Skagit, Sauk Seattle. And so I just wanted to call to our attention all of these different tribal nations and their different logos. And just so we have a recognition, I mean, these are all like independent governed communities that are within our own community. So just like we know what the flag of Canada looks like, it's important to know what the um, insignia of these different tribes look like. And for example, I mean, the Upper Skagit is a consolidation. I've been taught of a group of people um, who didn't want to sign one of the treaties and kind of came together and then were lumped in that category. And so sometimes these communities of people will lump together because it's easier to get federal recognition as a tribe for like the lumping than individual. Um, there's a lot of history in our region about tribal sovereignty. Some of that is old, such as the Point Elliott Treaty where like some of the original lines were drawn. And some of that is more recent, like the Fish Wars. Some of you might know this history. The Burke Museum in Seattle has a pretty good exhibit about it. There's a great um, resource, since time immemorial resource. Um, since time immemorial means before the time of human memory. And so that resource is available. Um, it's a curriculum for K-12 in Washington State, but it's got a lot of great uh, videos and other materials consolidated about indigenous history here. Would anyone like to speak about anything regarding these tribes? It, it's not one of these five, but the Nooksack um, tribe, you know, they also re rely on the North Cascades, um, upper parts of Nooksack River, and they have a two acre reservation, 2.2 acres. Pretty amazing that it's so small. I actually lived next door to their reservation and I spent a lot of time actually on the reservation by the river. They've got like this little old orchard and um, like some houses there and yeah it's really really tiny. Um, I would just was a neighbor like wandering through and trying to learn who my neighbors were and where I could get down to the river and I met someone and was invited to just go hang out there. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. So I will, I appreciate that there's, yeah there's a broader conversation about if we think about that map from the very beginning many, many different overlapping territories of communities of people. And some of these communities of people were moving from place to place. And so it is a little bit reductionist of me to just focus on four. Sometimes trivia is like that. We're trying to get an answer. So I appreciate all the contributions that you all are um, sharing. That's really important. OK, our final category, everyone, is the Where's Waldo category. I thought this was fun. What I did is I found a picture of Waldo 
and put Waldo in a couple different places in the North Cascades. So this is gonna go quick. So are you all ready for the first question? Get those buzzing fingers ready. Okay, so it's gonna be, where's Waldo? You're gonna see Waldo in the picture somewhere and you're gonna to have to identify where in the North Cascades the spot is. And go. Where's Waldo? Waldo's on top of that little peak. Which peak is that? Waldo's hanging out with Evan. I guess the bonus, Evan, would be, can you tell which peak you were on when you took the photo? Sure, I was on uh, Ruby Mountain. So you're looking straight north up Ross Lake. So, oh, we have a buzz in from Kathleen or John. It's a guess, but how about desolation? Incorrect, thank you. Sound effects won't work. Sorry, having a technical difficulty with the sound effect. <laughs> oh wait, another another buzz in from Kath, uh, Catherine. Fourth uh, of July. Mm. Incorrect. Nice. This is a very distinctive shape as one of the mountain peaks. I mean, they all have distinctive shapes. They've all been carved, but this one's particularly. Amelia for the save potentially. Wild guess, uh, Mount Baker. Ooh, unfortunately, no. Actually, Baker, if I can be a geology nerd, Baker as a volcano is a bit more rounded in its shape because it hasn't been, I and mean, it has glaciers on it, but it's also actively growing. So it gets that nice, like, I've eaten a lot of food, round tummy, round head. But this mountain is very jagged. In fact, the name, indigenous name for this mountain means sharp like a knife. Anyone? Uh, there is a buzz in from Kim. I'm now I'm torn. I thought I I was going to go a certain thing, and then now you just threw me. I don't know. I I don't know. Pyramid? No. Ugh. <laughs> okay, going once. Uh, the yeah, this is looking. We're looking north on Ross Lake towards the north border with Canada. Okay, y'all, I hope you have some fun backpacking out here this summer to get oriented to the landscape. The answer is Hosamine Peak. Maybe some of you are familiar with this, but Hosamine is particularly famous in the North Cascades. One, because it looks so jagged. It gets that name, that indigenous name, sharp like a knife. But also, first, it's right on the border with Canada. So you get people recreating and coming down Ross Lake from Canada, and then the U.S. people coming in from the U.S. side. Sometimes the marijuana gets shuffled back and forth too with that border, but in general, it's exciting. It's like a nice border marker mountain. But geologically, it is incredibly important as well as interesting to the history of the North Cascades. So why is it so exciting? Well, also a little trivial fact here. The North Summit is Washington's fourth steepest peak with an average angle in the summit of 38.86 degrees. But that's because this mountain um, contains, it's partially made up of rock, a type of rock called chert. Chert is made in the ocean floor when a bunch of plankton die. And it makes a rock that is like um, jasper or um, flint. Some of you might be familiar with chert. It's kind of a common name. But essentially, it's a rock that is very homogenous throughout its structure. And just like obsidian, if you flake it, it breaks in a conchoidally curved fracture pattern. And that makes it really good for making arrowheads. And so there are many tools that were derived from this specific type of chert at this mountain, hosamine. It's called the hosamine chert. The outcrop is actually at the mountain where this rock outcrops. And Indigenous people have been harvesting and trading this chert across a huge area, like all the way out east, I don't know how far south, um, for a long time. We have record since the last ice age. So that'd be like 10,000 years ago, 9,600 years ago is some of the dates for these. How do we know these dates? Well, thanks Mount Mazama, it helps us get a date on this. Um, but the Hosamine chert is a really important story in the North Cascades because the chemistry of that rock can be traced. So you can identify this is a piece of hosamine chert, even if it's way out, you know, in Montana. And then also, so the chemistry is really um, like a good marker. 
And then it shows how people were using the landscape back in time. I mean, 9,600 years ago is quite some time ago. There were potentially still like mammoths in the US. So there's a great um, video about the Hosemian Shur and the former archeologist of North Cascades National Park speaking about the story. So if you're nerdy, I put that um, link at the bottom, but if you just Google North Cascades National Park Hosemian Shur, you'll come across some great resources about it. Does anyone want to share? Does anyone have it? I like tried, I'm a geologist. I tried so hard to get myself a piece of Hosemian Shur and I do not have one, which is I'm very sad about, but. Okay, our next yeah. where's the question. I just want to make sure that you benefit from the pun that Amelia put into the chat. Did you see that pun? No, I didn't. Okay, I will recite it for you. If you were to get hit by an arrowhead made of this rock, it would really chert. <laughs> Amelia, this is fodder for the next cool t-shirt that can be given out as a prize for trivia night next year. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone. Um, let's go to our final Where's Waldo question. I'm gonna flip the slide and this means you gotta buzz in fast. Are we ready? Oh Here my go. gosh, she said a t-shirt? <laughs> the puns, the puns abound. Amelia, if you wanna help me uh, add more puns to the questions here, always looking to increase the number of puns. Okay, everyone, we're just flipping to the next slide. Here we go. Where is Waldo? I threw myself up there because I have a picture of myself at the spot and I spent way too many hours looking for it last night, but I did pop Waldo in here as well. I thought this would be really easy, but I'm glad that it's stumping people. <laughs> We've got a buzz in from Kathleen John. Try right, again, is that the desolation peak? Um lookout incorrect but oh. you're close to the fire lookout yep okay you can see you can see a glacially fed reservoir that's like that blue green color of the lake down there is because glaciers are flowing into it so there's a couple lakes and the there's like one lake in particular in the national park that is that it's a we big lake and it's that baby blue we have another buzz in from Fritz. Go ahead, Fritz. Uh, I guess it's uh, Sourdough Mountain. Mm. Wow, Fritz coming in. You haven't answered very many, but way to go. That is correct. It is Sourdough Mountain Lookout. We're looking um, in this direction. You're kind of looking like south out across the landscape, southeast or so. And um, I thought I would end us with a little poem. This is my favorite poem, and I'm I had it memorized and I got to get it back under my belt. Um, this is by Gary Snyder. Evan, would you like to read this poem? Why, of course I would. <clears throat> Mid-August at Sourdough Mountain Lookout by Gary Snyder. Down valley, a smoke haze. Three days heat after five days rain. Pitch glows on the fir cones. Across rocks and meadows, swarms of new flies. I cannot remember things I once read. A few friends, but they are in cities. Drinking snow, cold snow water from a tin cup, looking down for miles through high, still air. And so most of the fire lookouts in our range are about between five and 6,000 feet in elevation. And this one is particularly uh, steep and challenging to get up to, but if you do, it's really rewarding to remind yourself that when you visit the North Cascades, you're really in a sea of glacially carved, very steep mountain peaks. So we're gonna end this round. Evan, you wanna announce how we're doing with the winner? I could, I could also just let people guess who's in the lead. <laughs> but we do have some, uh, some, some very important uh, people to mention. Kim's got a couple points. She picked up. Uh, she picked up some points there. Amelia got a point. Um, I gave her a point for that pun, and we gave Rebecca a point for um, remembering the name of the Samish tribe. And as you all saw, Fritz had a wonderful answer there. So Fritz has a point as well. 
Well done, everyone. Um, we're gonna move to our final challenge. This is, as it says on the slide, your last chance for glory. So here we go, final challenge question. I would like folks to chat and answer, and if you chat and answer that fits the question, you'll get a point. How can you make a difference? So based on what we were chatting about tonight, all the different aspects of the natural history, what are some tangible, concrete ways that you can maybe visit, recreate, educate about this place to make a difference? Send your answer to Evan in the chat. This is called a call to action. Yeah, nice, Rebecca. Stay on the trail, protect the soil. Rebecca gets a point. <laughs> Go snowmobile. God, that was a strong anti-snowmobile. I don't mean to be so political. I'm not all. I am always anti-motorized vehicles, but it's. Yeah. <laughs> and Amelia says, you can learn and educate others about the indigenous tribes whose land the park lies on. Education is so important to inspire the current and next generations. You're a ringer, Amelia. Um, Kathleen, reduce fossil fuel use to help save snowpack, glaciers, salmon, et cetera, et cetera. That may have come from John. John slash Kathleen, the dynamic duo. Gina Roberti herself says, incorporate more puns so people remember what I am teaching about. <laughs> and Catherine says, in Seattle, we all know and admire the Skagit Valley, but I don't think people understand the importance of the river for many reasons. Continue learning more and sharing the information with Seattleites. Excellent answers all around. Those, each of those answers garnered, garnered you uh, one whole point, folks. So. I'm gonna tabulate those now. Well, thanks everyone. Um, I've been, as as Evan's tallying, I just wanna put in a plug for doing field trips in classes with North Cascades Institute, both virtual and in-person. Especially in-person, you can connect with other people in the class in a way that some of these uh, aspects that you're speaking about can really start to happen as you like build community and learn a little bit more about the place. So. Thanks so much for coming out for the trivia. I hope you all learned more. And if anyone's interested, I'm happy to share the slideshow if you'd like to run your own trivia in different places or if you wanna share some of the content out. Amelia did really well for not going. I don't know if you've never been there before, you did really well. <laughs> yes, so um, Gina, do you wanna um, hop back to the prizes slide? Yes, okay, there we are. Um, so actually, when I put these prizes up here, I just thought, oh, hat, t-shirt, we'll get those figured out. Um, let's call the hat the third place prize. So the third place prize, I wonder if there's a drum roll on my little sound effect app I got. I got a rim shot, so that's close enough. Third place is Rebecca. Woo! Hang on, I got another, a good one here. That's a great <laughs> hat. I'm jealous. Okay, second place prize goes to Amelia. That's, the second place prize is a t-shirt. So um, that's what you got. There'll be, a, uh, each of those, there's a variety to choose from on the website. And I will follow up with you individually so you can choose your t-shirt and hat. And grand prize goes to the dynamic duo, Kathleen and John. Nice work, Fabulous. <laughs> well, thanks so much, everyone. I really encourage you to spread the word about North Cascades Institute classes and programs because it's a way of like building collective community 
and awareness about our natural world. I hope you had fun with the trivia. You're welcome to reach out to me. I'll stay on the call for a couple minutes if anyone has questions, but otherwise you can just send me an email if you're ever interested in some of the content that I pulled up or some of the sources that you can kind of rabbit hole your way through. Evan, you want to close us out here? I do, and I want to start closing us out by saying thank you to Gina, our quiz master. Woohoo! Here, let's do this. Yeah, that was um, information laden, and I was really glad to see how much, how educationally made the program tonight, Gina. Um, we always love working with our soon-to-be celebrity educator, Gina Roberti. Spunk and knowledge to boot. Um, I want to also thank you all for coming out tonight. I know virtual programs, sometimes they're super cool. You get to stay at home and learn. So I'm glad to see that um, people like that. Um, don't forget that simply by answering any question tonight, you will receive one of these questions as well, or a little mixed up at this point. You will receive one of these stickers as well. Um, so, I have your information um, in our magical database Salesforce. So if you want to send me a different um, shipping address for these little items, um, you can do that. And I will send a follow-up email is the point I'm getting at here. There'll be a follow-up email to this program that has the recording and um, you can watch it again. And you, if you have a different address than the one we have on record, go ahead and send that uh, as a reply to my follow-up email. And I can't let you go without telling you that coming up shortly, we have three more programs that I just want to put on your radar. Landscape Photography with Scott Kranz. He'll be focusing on how to use the manual mode when you're doing some mountain photography and such. And another photography class, Go With The Flow, Waterfall and Stream Photography with um, very spunky educator Juan Aguilera. That'll be in person um, up on Highway 20 near the Learning Center. And then coming up on April 27th, we have Wolves in Washington, which will be an update program with some Q&A uh, with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as their group, the Wolf Advisory Group, which is a combined stakeholder group. So really, really interesting program with lots of different perspectives. Um, and it's always really fun to learn about what's happening with wolves because not to spoil anything, they're in Washington. So uh, I want to end tonight again just by saying thanks, everybody. You can um, visit us online at cascades.org. We've got a newsletter, but I think you all have been to one program or two before. So thanks for coming back, and we will see you soon. Good night, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Insert theme song here. Yeah. <laughs> Put on your own music and play your own theme song. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. That was really fun. Thanks really so much, it. Kim. I don't know if I've met you. No, I, I feel like I know you through pictures and video and stuff, but this is my first class with you. And I, I put this in the chat, but I know you're not really looking at the chat, but like so many people have been like, she's so such a good instructor. Like she's amazing. So I'm like, yay, finally. So great job. Thank you so much. That's really generous. It was really fun geeking out with everybody else. <laughs> I hope to see you at other programs, everyone. So good night. Good night. All right. Wow. Other questions? It was really fun to have you all. Hi. How did you have you. <laughs> Sorry, I just realized my camera was off the whole time, but thank you. <laughs> no, I can only see like four videos at a time when I tile them so I can see my slides. So I saw like four of you cycling through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. Learned a lot. Cool. Ciao. Sorry, we didn't mean to be like unfair advantage doubling up. But FYI, I gave a bunch of uh, Christmas presents to Kathleen, and I think three of them uh, of experiences, and I think three of them were uh, North Cascades Institute classes. So this was one. Oh, right on. It was cool. a delayed, delayed delivery Christmas present. Oh, nice. Oh. Cool. Well, hopefully, we'll see you out at another program. Yeah, we'll, we'll be at the uh, the landscape photography one next, I think. So the virtual program with with Scott, the uh, using manual. Yeah, yeah. Modes for landscape photography. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, cool. he's a great. All right. All right. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Good night. Woohoo! That was fun, that was... friend. Way to go.
Yeah, I think we can. Um, here we go. Hey, okay, I gotta turn this off. <laughs> it like became really bright. Um, hi, that was really fun. I want to do it in front of like fifty people. Like, I want to do it in like a big way. Yeah, that was interesting. We got nine people. Um, I guess folks are gonna watch the recording, which is fine. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of boring, but okay. <laughs> Yeah. I think virtual programs these days, it's just, it's like impossible to know yeah. what people are thinking about them. Totally. Yeah. I know. I mean, I'm, I'm doing some and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be there synchronously. I'm just going to like listen to it later. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah. 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 I don't know if NCI ever wants to do something in person, like, like we could do this at a pub in Seattle or something or like a pub in Bellingham, like, yeah all the work that went into like making the questions and stuff if we got a different audience like it's really reproducible or we could like change some of the questions but yeah I'd love to do it again yeah that'd be that's form. an interesting thought that um like we've already done a lot of legwork setting up a trivia round mm -hmm. the, like we know you set up the spreadsheet for tracking it's like really easy and good to go it is yeah yeah okay well, that's a fun idea yeah I know that um we, what we want to do is more like, I'm just going to make a note here. Like I would come to Bellingham and see, like hang out with you, but also do trivia night. Like I could take the train. Oh yeah, that's right. That'd be fun. Yeah, we can do that. Or um, as an in-person program, we've been talking about doing more like fun, lighthearted stuff through, at NCI. I, I floated that idea today and it was well received. So mm. yeah, it doesn't all have to be like, let's climb a peak and learn about exotic high alpine stuff although that we want to do that too yeah i mean i think i mean i really i i like really want to come back to nci i feel a lot of pressure to hold my job right now like mm -hmm. i'm on st helens oh, it's like yeah we're like barely we, we don't have any seasonal educators hired right now so it's like i'm going to be working like every program and I'm like, oh, I just want to say yes to being in, like, I would be a mountain school instructor just to be up there. I mean, maybe I would take like a bigger job up there, but I, I don't know. I feel it's very like torn, right? There's like oh. this whole community world now that I have in the city in Portland. Yeah. And like NCI is like pretty far out. So I was thinking like a seasonal gig might be good, but that's why the IC is so awesome for me. Cause I can like go up and tap in, still keep my regular job, whatever. Mm -hmm. but yeah I'll talk about that with Maria sure just let her know like I feel like I know the NCA programs really well I feel super like chill and flexible yeah. I don't I actually don't have the schedule flexibility that much anyways to be able to like I took the whole month of May last season that's true uh, yeah. but I could yeah especially in the winter time that can also be good but yeah, I'm open. Anyways, I don't know. I'd love to see you too. I actually haven't been up to Bellingham since the pandemic. We were supposed to have like an NCI reunion and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but I don't know. This was really fun and it would be easier for me to do something like this if it wasn't as far as the ELC and like maybe you could get a different audience. Like if you did. Yeah. yeah. We do one at the co-op and in, in Cedar, um, not Cedar Woolley. What's the little town? Um, Mount Vernon. Um, yeah, the Mount Vernon co-op, they do mm -hmm. programs there. And then it could be like extending the mission to like to connect to more people in their communities. Yeah. Yeah. I will offload the idea. It's a good one. Yeah, it's not whatever the what I'm what we created is like not going anywhere, it's just hanging out. So if it's like a year down the road or something. Yeah. 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 But I it's fun to work with you as the game show host. Yeah. <laughs> I like had all these ideas like right as the program was starting like oh, I should have made like some fun theme song thing or I should have like gotten some cool graphic that's like a star banner coming across the screen but next time you know oh yeah I was like the whole time I was like getting more and more orange as like the light faded <laughs> I was, like really wanted to turn this light off but then it would have like yeah. Yeah. but anyways um yeah okay well I so I do you are you sending people a survey about the class because I do have a survey that's generic for like the classes that I've been teaching for myself for my own tracking we don't we're not really asking for specific feedback we're just saying if you have feedback you can email it to us okay. but if you want me to include something you can email that to me sure yeah I'll send that to you 
when we get off the call, I just have like a online thing and that way I can like track over time as I'm doing these, like how I can improve. Oh yeah, sure, send it so, to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and ooh, I was gonna say, oh, I'm interested in maybe doing that history of rock presentation again. I've been thinking about like how it could be better. Mm. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to, yeah, think about scheduling something like that for the fall or something. But it's kind of a cool topic. I could nerd out about it. And I feel like it's so complex that, yeah. Hmm. I can, um, yeah, I can talk about that. We've got a new program manager coming in. You know, if you're thinking about applying for jobs at NCI, you know, we, we, we were hiring for two manager positions. Yeah, shoot. I know. There well, no, it's- We're like mountain school. I don't think we're going to hire another coordinator, but um, yeah, you know, I'll give you a little, you know what, the recording is still happening. Let me stop that. 